you to welcome to your Nooner with Tuner, your Fiverr with the drivers. Thank you for tuning in. If you're on YouTube, you're on the live stream over on X, on Facebook, and now, of course, Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking, Channel 146. Thanks for joining us on the show. We got a, we got a lot to talk about today, obviously. You guys all saw that bridge collapse yesterday. That was probably the most sort of shocking American footage I've seen since... 9-11, I, I woke up in the middle of the night, I had gone to go to the bathroom, it was about like 2, 2.30 in the morning, and I checked X to clear out some notifications, and, and you know, you see that bridge image, and the first thing I thought was like, is this AI, is this an old image, is this from a movie, is this even real, and unfortunately it was, we have some great guests here to talk about it today though, on today's episode, it's 698 of What the Truck, I'm talking to Project 44 CEO and, CEO and founder Jet McCandless about that bridge strike in Baltimore, what happens in the aftermath of the Francis Scott Key Bridges falling. We'll also look at what's new with Project 44, what 2024 means for the visibility space, and hey, they just had a court case, so maybe we'll get into that as well. We've got J.J. Keller's Mark Shedler. He's talking about road tests and driver screening. We'll filter. We'll find out how to filter out the bad apples and how to make sure you're not putting your fleet and your clients at risk. Chevrolet Tellus Super Rig winner Teresa DeSantis is here to talk about women driving on the road, um, having a working beauty pageant truck, and why her theme is witches. We'll figure that one out and echo global logistics molly mangan is talking about insure tech for ltl shipments but right now we have jet mccandless with us he's the founder and ceo at project 44 jet it's great to see you great being on the show again thanks for having me back now, I remember on Monday, I reached out to you and I texted you and I said, uh, hey, um, here's what I was thinking about getting into. What do you want to get into? This was before the bridge strike. And like you and I both know in this industry, disruptions can be some of the hardest things, well, probably the hardest things to forecast. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And typical uh, your style, you were a full beat ahead of me on the current events and what were happening. Uh, I got to caution you, though, like checking Twitter in the middle of the night is is not 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 a good way to get good quality sleep. I don't know how we can make that adjustment, but uh, it's not a full night cycle ahead of me on that. Jed, it's not, it's not. And when you see something like that, I didn't end up going back to sleep. I just ended up, I needed more information on this story. Yeah. The mayor of Baltimore, Mayor Brandon Scott, he said it was, do we got footage? It said it was something like out of an action movie. Look at this collapse right here. For those of you who were in a coma yesterday, perhaps, or you just haven't got caught up on this, what happened is we have the MV Dolly over here. And what happened is it came out of port about a half hour before that collision. Um, tugs pulled it out away from the dock. It did a loop like all vessels do leaving there. As it was coming out it appeared to lose power twice it may have even dropped anchor and in the end an overcorrection on it made it hit that bridge right there it took that pillar out the bridge came down almost instantly fortunately when that first power outage had happened reports are saying that they alerted um they alerted the authorities at the port who let people know not to cross that bridge yet if you look closely you could see some semi trucks some cars going by beforehand fortunately they were able to stop them unfortunately there's about six workers on that bridge fixing potholes holes and they've given up the surf the, the search the, for them they don't think there's any, obviously going to be any life anymore and now it's just a recovery mission yeah it's a sad story my uh, condolences for the families that are impacted with that it's uh, obviously a big big tragedy and to your point it's a major piece of infrastructure I mean, i think we see something physical like this crumble or or be destroyed uh it's really impactful to us so much as supply chain tends to be invisible in day-to-day -day life and here we could see it front and center and a lot of us have probably crossed that bridge or or know people that, that are impacted by it but had a loss of power uh obviously a thorough investigation will happen but you know understanding uh what truly happened there will take take quite a bit of time i can tell you it's going to impact the automotive industry quite a bit that's the number one port in the u.s for auto so you're seeing many many auto companies out of the top 10 auto uh, manufacturers out there, nine of them are Project 44 customers. We're monitoring that really closely. And what we're seeing is that uh, obviously you have the, 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 the containers that are stuck within the port that are being exported. And then you have the, the inbound, uh, not only the inbound containers destined to Baltimore, but you also have the ships that were there uh, doing essentially a, a, a stop, a stop off. Uh, and those, those shipments are also being impacted. And then of course, uh, these companies are, are pretty resilient. So you'll see them look for other parts of uh, other ports of discharge, you know, on that Eastern seaboard, but that of course will have downstream impacts on what you see with dray carriers. Um, do they have contracts with dray carriers? There is their capacity or there enough chassis 
Uh, so we will see some impacts here. It's too early to say how big of an impact that's going to be, but we're monitoring it closely and with $80 billion in annual freight going through there. Uh, it's it's going to be uh, somewhat meaningful. And I think auto is going to have the biggest impact. Yeah, you know, we cover um, Will, William Doyle is a good friend of mine. He used to be the director over the port over there. And we last year, if, if you're a viewer of the show, you might have caught that. We were talking a lot about the auto vessel. They just put, did a bunch of dredging over there to do expansion at the port. A lot of investments have gone into the port of Baltimore. The latest updates from this is the NTSB chair said the investigators have gone on. Obviously, they're going to get that black box. They have to do research into what happened here, how exactly this happened. A lot of rumors as it is. I mean, it's a foreign vessel. It hit American infrastructure. A lot of rumors immediately cropped up online that this was a cyber hack, right? Or a terrorist attack. There's no evidence of that so far. This just seems to be piloting error. I do understand why people not familiar with the space may think that this, that does not seem to be the case. The crew on that vessel, by the way, Jet see how it's covered and all that? They're saying now it could take up to two weeks to get this crew off the boat because they have to A, investigate what happened with the ship, but B, they also have to make sure that boat there doesn't sink. Oh, wow. I hadn't heard that. That's... Uh... It's a tough, tough situation. Um, you could just look at the destruction there, and that is going to take m many months, maybe even years, to to get that out. I'm obviously not a construction expert, but wow. You see that building there, too? That'll just give you some perspective. For those of you who are not used to going into ports, you're not used to steamship lines, uh, you may have got some perspective when the Suez Canal happened. This right here, that's a building that is, I think, 893 feet, that skyscraper. The vessel itself was 894 feet. The bridge itself, it's 1.6 miles. And if you keep an eye on this, this will give you an idea of just how long this thing was. Jet, you mentioned the trade disruptions. Port of Baltimore, 2023, $80.8 .8 billion in trade, including 1.1 million uh, TEUs, that's 20-foot equivalent units, 1.3 million tons of that roll-on, roll-off farm equipment you mentioned, 847,000 shipments of cars and light trucks. They're saying now it will, first of all, Biden said that the taxpayers will pay for this. This also got some people upset. Don't worry, maritime insurance is still going to get involved. It's just that, look, our country, it takes forever to get things done over here, right, Jet? And they need to start rebuilding this thing. We've lost a critical connection. Also, not just for the roll-off, roll-off, for, for the hazmat route, too. That's the hazmat route in Baltimore for trucks. Yeah. Yeah, it's obviously that ripple effect is going to go for many, many years. Uh, and I won't I'll try not to be too cynical, but you think about what are the, not only removing the, the destruction, but also building. What does that look like? How do you run bids? Um, who's selected for that? What's the price of it? Uh, it's, it's, it's a very unfortunate event that's going to, going to be felt for quite some time. And you think about even in that local market, how it's going to impact jobs and communities. It's, it's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be pleasant at all. Now, obviously, f this is going to disrupt freight flow. It's a little bit ear early to see that invisibility. But have you had any clients impacted? What are you seeing early on? Obviously, the other East Coast ports are going to have to pick this up. But but we are in an environment, Jet, where there's also the Red Sea conflict. There's also the Panama Canal, the lower water levels going on over there. Yeah. So suddenly, there's a, a ton of moving parts and a ton of disruptions happening right here in the maritime space. Hey, look at so you mentioned Red Sea, huge disruptor that's ha that's out there. Uh, you mentioned Panama Canal. We've seen that kind of improve and decrease. We we'll see what happens here in May and rainy season. And also, the Black Sea is another uh, conflict, heated, disputed area that's that's impacting trade. And you know, what we've seen is, I think, since freight levels are down, we've seen resilience from the steamship lines and the ports managing through this, and the freight forwarders and the brokers and the carriers. So, relatively pretty impressive. Uh, but if the freight volumes tick up and some folks are saying, hey, we, we've already navigated the soft landing, that maybe interest rates are going to be cut and we'd see an increase in, in demand uh, for products, then we would see an increase in uh, transportation and things could get pretty wonky pretty fast. I'm not sure it's quite black swan event, but if there's a labor strike or some type of other natural disaster, perhaps all these things come together as a, as a black swan event. Yeah, the other thing to be sort of concerned about here, Dominic Tulo, uh, he's a buddy of mine. He's a fuel distributor. He works, he's got uh, stations up in New Jersey. He mentions that a good chunk of the Northeast D, uh, DEF supply, DEF supply is barged into POB, Port of Boston. So this could create a supply squeeze over in the terminals up in the Northeast. So also something to consider. Now, there's still plenty of capacity. We haven't, we're not in like that 2021 situation where everything is a mess. So other ports should be able to absorb 
this, but you know, volume start up, start ticking up. We could be in a uh, in a new problem area. Now, before we move on to something else, do you think that this will be a market catalyst yet? It's 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 tough to say. I think we're probably a pretty good signal over the next week. It's you know how many chassis are at these other ports, how many dray carriers can be repositioned. Um, it is, it's, it's a meaningful port and especially to some sectors, uh, but it's obviously, it's only, I think the 15th largest port in, in the country. So I'd be surprised if this alone is a catalyst, but you look at a few of those other events you mentioned, and if the economy does pick up and there starts to be more importing, uh, then yeah, it, it gets, it's possible. Uh, too early for me to forecast on how I think it'll be, but I can tell you that our customers that use Project 44 are getting this real-time information, this data, and they're able to see how they're being impacted and they're able to make, make adjustments. We've already seen a lot of our auto customers start to take uh, swift action plans, whether that's expediting shipments or starting to look at air cargo for parts, or they're um, looking at <clears throat> alternative distributors or other suppliers to bring products into different ports. So. Uh, it would be interesting to see what this does regulatorily, too, as, as one of the reasons that it hit this pole, is it uh, this pillar, is it lost power under there? Uh, part of the policy in Port of Baltimore is tugs just get you away from the dock once you're under your own power. You're bringing yourself through there. I think San Diego, the port over there, has a similar um, method. But it'll be interesting to see if that policy changes nationwide amongst ports where tugs will now have to bring you through that bridge berth. might not be a terrible idea. Yeah, it's, it's, that's kind of what I thought about there is, you know, uh, what's the additional cost to have the tugs come that much farther? It's probably relatively significant from a dollar basis, but if you look at risk downside, probably small, but and I think uh, I think I heard Sal mention it's the largest uh, maritime accident with a uh, container ship since the 1980s. So if you average it out, it may not be um, that impactful, but if you look at the lives that are impacted and you look at... Uh, when the incident does happen and how traumatic it could be, uh, it's it's very meaningful. It is. It is. Hey, speaking of me, and, and look, our thoughts and prayers with everybody involved in this. We'll keep you updated and all that. But moving on, last week, big week for Project 44, a court case has moved forward a little bit. I'm not sure how much you can say about this, but do you have any comment on that case? Yeah, I, I try not to comment on open legal cases too much, yeah. but... Uh, it is an interesting situation, I would say. Uh, it's good to see the justice system uh, working. I think it's, I find it very, very bizarre. I mean, you essentially have private equity and venture capital firms essentially supporting corporate espionage, not only supporting it, but also funding it um, and keeping the existing management and, and in place. So I know if I was a pension fund or an LP and funds like this, I would, I would be asking questions, but uh, it's, I find it, I find it really peculiar. And, um, uh, you know, what I'll say is that when they go low, we go high and we're just going to keep operating our business. The irony of this whole situation is, uh, four kites is probably about twice our size when they, when they uh, made these, these false comments and now, you know, we're more than double their size. So, uh, you know, I think just for folks out there, and I think I have a lot of support because this industry just has so much, so many people that are high integrity. And, uh, you know, these types of shortcut games just don't get you to on a long term uh, game plan. It's a small industry. No, not at all. And I appreciate your comments. I realize it's an ongoing case. There's only so much you can say. Uh, before we go to Fast Company, a nice little honor that you received, though. What's next in this story? What happens from here? Well, we're continuing to, to take legal action uh, against four kites and uh, go after what the damages are uh, for them. You know, it's obviously um, quite impactful uh, for something like that. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to take it all the way. Justice will be served. Well, hey, good luck, and hopefully the court you. sees it your way. Now, uh, away from the bad things, on to some good things here. A little cowbell for you. You were named Fast Company, uh, most innovative logistics companies in 2024 for, sir, you've heard of this term, people out there, a chat GPT-like functionality. Talk a little bit about this and what that does. Yeah, it's, you know, it's I'm sure most of yours now have used ChatGPT. If you haven't, I feel like it's my uh, my responsibility to make sure that it's tab one or tab two on your browser, <laughs> right there next to Google. Uh, certainly ahead of LinkedIn. 
And it's it's really remarkable. Uh, hopefully, uh, Project 44's movement tab is, is right up there also in your day to day when you're managing a supply chain. But when I started using ChatGPT a little over a year ago in October, it was just remarkable the answers that were coming back. And I was actually quite confused at first. I thought it was maybe calling the internet, I and mean, that's not what's happening at all with this with this application. And I think you're really in this world now where you have this bifurcation that's starting to happen. People that know how to use this AI technology and people that don't know how to use this AI technology. And we could have an entire show about the pros and cons of it. But when I looked at the responses I was getting from ChatGPT, I looked at our very unique data set that we had, which was is the largest synchronous aggregation of logistics data of any company I'm aware of in the world. And I thought, what if we took this technology and we applied it onto our data set? And rather than clicking through filters or looking through screens, what if you could just ask questions? Um, so ChatGPT is connected into Project 44's data set. It's a, excuse me, anonymized data, so everything's safe there and it's private. But you can see some really interesting answers come back, sometimes interesting in a bad way and sometimes yeah. interesting in a really remarkable way. But it's certainly the, uh, a big part of the future, uh, both for Project 44 and uh, for the rest of the world outside of Project 44. How do you keep it from, you, you mentioned it gives some funny, and we've all noticed, we've all like, hey, this thing seems great when you put in something you may not know that well, then there's sometimes when you put in like, like for us being in a niche like freight, you can kind of tell right away when it's completely wrong. Um, how do you make sure that it's, how do you train it so that it doesn't give you those sort of like hallucinatory answers? Well, we, we try to hire the best data scientists, the best engineers and put, uh, put this information together. I think what I've noticed is that for us, it really, if it misses context, that's where it gets a little bizarre. Yeah. So let's say I typed in uh, West Coast ports impacted by Baltimore incident. Like, does ChatGPT have that current event? Probably, probably not. And then you have to say, well, is it West Coast? Are we talking the West Coast of Europe or West Coast of the United States? Well, probably for a lot of viewers here that were mostly U.S. Uh, viewer base, they would just assume that the the chat GPT knew where they were at. And you can start to add in some logic, like, well, where's the IP address of that, of that laptop or of that, that phone where that was done. But then of course, those are mobile devices. So you could be in Europe asking a question from like a very ethnocentric American point of view. Um, and so just working through all those uh, little details, actually uh, how you refine this product to make it more and more valuable. But there's so many use cases when you look at AI in general, um, and this, I think, is just kind of a, a, a fun kind of party trick at the current time of uh, what, how to use AI in logistics. It's very, it's interesting too. You mentioned you already were plugging Baltimore into there to, to find out what kind of disruptions. I was curious though, like, what is the data set that goes into it? Because, um, like with ChatGPT, you know, like I think the data set cuts off in like 2021, so it isn't that up on current events. How do you make sure this thing has like a, like a news RSS or something? Yeah, for us, we've got a, so what we do is we, we pull in news and then we pull in uh, obviously our, our data set and then chat GPT and try to contextualize it. That's why it's like, it's a journey. And these models take a long time to learn. You've got to give inputs into them. Uh, but then our data set, to give you an idea, we have about a little over $200 billion of freight spend that goes through Project 44. So it's a quite significant, it's over $2.5 trillion of GDP that goes through Project 44. So. If you figure there's over $75 trillion of goods that are shipped, it gives you an idea from a percentage standpoint, relatively low, but uh, from a log tech, neutral, global, multimodal, I'm not aware of any company in the world that has that data set to put in um, and, and bounce off chat GPT. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's fun. Um, sometime we could talk if you ever want about AI and all the other ways to use it in logistics. But like I said, it's, it's a bit of a party trick, fun to show customers. And talk about, hey, we're investing this, and this is this is a big part of the future. Hey, what was your biggest takeaway from your own event? I saw you up on stage, Velocity, P44's event. I believe this was down in Atlanta, not too far from me. What happened down there? Yeah. Well, we had our first – we're always trying to figure out, like, marketing dollars, budgets, like, where do, you, where do you spend, and what do you do? I think last year we went to about 60 trade shows. Freightways has some of the best ones out there. We like uh, attending those, but – Globally, we have, you know, our product works in 186 countries every day. So that's where we get to go to so many trade shows. And you have a trade show, a trade show booth, people stop by, they check it out. But are you really ever getting the message and are you really having the opportunity to, to really drill in? Um, and are customers able to learn from customers? And a lot of times, 
you know, trade shows just aren't set up for that. So we said, hey, why don't we, why don't we put together something really cool? We created a new category that's bigger than visibility. It's, it's high velocity supply chains. Visibility is a component of that. But all these companies out here want to get a high velocity supply chain. And then we said, let's create this essentially roadshow. Um, and we're called Velocity. Obviously, the play is on city. And we're going around to about eight or nine countries around the world, Tokyo, Chicago, um, uh, also in, uh, in, in Hamburg, Germany, a lot, of, a lot of cities around the world. This was in Atlanta, Georgia is the first one. We're bringing our customers there. And we let our customers talk about how they're using um, the products under really tight you know, Chatham House rules and what they're doing, how they're solving problems, just get them all together. So it's not about the size of the conference, it's about the quantity and the depth and what information is being shared amongst customers. And I thought that was phenomenal. I was actually blown away when I could hear customers talk for 45 minutes or an hour about how they were using our high velocity platform, whether it's managing the Red Sea. Um, there was a very large beverage company that probably all of your, your, your listeners drink at least once a week. And they were talking uh, just on the side to me, and they were talking about how they reduced their expedited shipments by many, many orders of magnitude. And so not only did that reduce their costs when they were looking at the data for Red Sea with Project 44, but it reduced the emissions. I thought that was phenomenal. And then there were other really great companies out there that were uh, manufacturing and distribution and retail and how they improved, uh, how they reduced their, where's my order, my Wismo, how they reduced their inventory, how they lowered their fines and fees with demergent detention. I already talked about the expedited, but it seems to be a big thing on how they're reducing their expedited costs, avoiding plant shutdowns, and then also improving the efficiencies at their warehouse uh, warehouses just for labor planning and efficiencies. Um, so the reality is, is that if you do that, all that, you can also improve the consumer experience, customers buy more, you have less stockouts, and lower your costs. So that's, that's a win to hear. I don't know, uh, I don't follow a ton of sports, yeah, <laughs> but I had the opportunity back in the green room to talk to Mike Ingram, uh, the second. I what a legend that guy is! Like really cool guy to hang out with. Um, I thought he kept it real. It was just interesting to hear about his life journey growing up in Flint, Michigan, and what he's accomplished, and uh, just kind of how he operates his life. So really uh, awesome event. I'm proud of our our team and really thankful for all our customers that contributed. Well, it sounds awesome, Jet. I'll maybe I'll have to go one of these days, maybe next year. It was a, it sounded like a great time. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for giving us some insight. What's going on on P forty four? What's going on in the aftermath of that bridge strike? In the meantime, people want to connect with Project forty four, bring that visibility to their supply chain. Where do I send them to? Uh, www.project44.com. Thanks. And I love your, your X handle, Freight Pipes. You've got one of the best ones out there. I just love it, Freight Pipes. <laughs> Jed, thank you so much, man. Take care. Say hi to your boys for me, and I, uh, and have a great day. Will do. Cheers. Bye. Take it easy. All right, everybody. Meanwhile. In Brazil, truck drivers often raise the rear suspension of their trucks by up to two meters and lower the front part, referring to this style as Brazilian style. The drivers claim that they choose this method to cope with poor road conditions. However, the most crucial reason for modifying trucks in this way is security. In Brazil, there are many highway robbers who jump onto the back of trucks to steal their cargo. By elevating the trucks like this, it becomes difficult for robbers to climb onto the trucks from the rear. <laughs> that sounds, it looks like an awful idea. I don't know. Maybe there's some function. TJ White says, when the load shifts, drivers buried in cargo. What could go wrong? Real John Galt says, I don't drive this truck because of the Tennessee DOT. Mr. Grinch says, you know what reduces the risk of theft? Claymores. Mobile truck repair says, the fast and furious deterrent for 0.1 seconds. Fabricio Dispatcher says, this style was used on youth cars, but now only the owner operators used to do it. Pretty common in, in Brazil, but not for bug carriers not for big carrier fleets almost also isn't allowed by the police so i guess that's legal and jgn says gets terrific mileage because it's always going downhill all right mark shedler senior transportation management editor at jj keller well, what do you think about that do they teach that in driver training uh no actually i actually went through schneider's uh, driver training and nobody uh, jacked up the truck on me but they did lock up the brakes and make me do skip backs it looked uh, it, it looked both dangerous, uh, impressive, and probably not something your insurance company would ever want to see, and something you definitely wouldn't want to do during a road test, which, conveniently, we're talking about today, and my first question is for you. In your experience, why are driver road tests so important? 
Well, uh, FMCSA minimums aren't very rigorous. You to try to get a read on whether the driver is safe or not. You pull an MVR and you contact their prior employers from the last three years for road, uh, for uh, dates of employment and DOT crashes. So why uh, why not put a lot into your first hand evaluation of the driver? And, you know, carriers have three choices. They can use an exception, which I'm not a fan of. The exceptions apply uh, to drivers other than tankers, doubles, and triples. You can accept a CDL, that's it, and or a road test certificate issued in the last three years. So, uh, you know, skipping the only chance to get your eyes on a driver, I, I just can't support, but it is allowed, I gotta say that. Uh, you can, second, you can meet the minimums in 391.31, and, do the things that are required, or third, you can meet the minimums and add some best practices uh, to your game and, uh, and up your road test game. Mark, let, let me ask you about that. You, what are some of the best practices you've uh, used in operations managing a fleet? Well, the, the, I think the you know, most important thing is when you run a road test, don't leave the documentation that says the driver had defects in these certain areas, but we passed them anyway, and not have remedial training uh, to correct those uh, documented before you cut them uh, loose, because a plaintiff attorney would basically have a roadmap to say uh, to negligent uh, uh, supervision right out of the uh, gate. So document any defects with and uh, correct it with the remedial training. Uh, next, we required uh, extensive uh, evaluation of backing skills, and there's nothing more embarrassing uh, than getting uh, hung up uh, on some of your first deliveries for a carrier and having an audience on the dock watching you uh, unable to back uh, back in. So we uh, don't assume that drivers have the skills they need. Uh, we make sure that part of the road test, we kind of extend that uh, portion of it and then conduct remedial training, of course, before uh, sending them off. Uh, also, we require uh, a CDL for the road tester that's not part of the uh, regs. Uh, you just have to have a competent examiner. So uh, in case a test goes bad, which happened a few times in my uh, career, the evaluator had to bring a parked truck on, uh, let's say, I-465 in Indy uh, back to the uh, back to the barn because the evaluator just threw for the road test, he uh, just threw their hands up and could, couldn't make it the rest of the way. Oh, wow. Uh, also, we evaluated our road test uh, results after, uh, you know, let's say 30 days of a road tester uh, doing the tests. We made sure they were upholding our standards uh, fairly and consistently and weren't uh, too biased. And then this didn't happen in my carriers, but I can see that using a professional road test uh, organization can help uh, either, you know, certain types of carriers that just don't have the bandwidth to have uh, the kind of staff that I was fortunate enough to uh, have at the larger carriers that I worked for. Mark, how often, you, you said something interesting there, you're like, oh yeah, they throw up their hands. How often did, did I'm, I'm, now I'm just curious, how often do people quit during these road tests? Rarely, uh, but we do observe uh, things that are kind of disturbing. Uh, you know, road rage is a, is a problem, and uh, if you've got uh, drivers that you know aren't allowing other people to get on uh, the freeway and swearing at other drivers, you know they're not headed for a good uh, career. So we try to short circuit uh, that part. Um, but yeah. not, not often do they just quit uh, a few times in my entire uh, J career. They just might need to simmer down a little bit. Well, what carriers do you think yeah. can benefit from third-party road testing services? Well, uh, I can tell you firsthand that J.J. Keller offers uh, professional road testing. Um, if a carrier is trying to grow and they're either regulated or not regulated, you want to evaluate the people operating vehicles under your DOT number uh, or uh, just operating for your company. Uh, if you're trying to grow rapidly, I know you know there's delivery services where you can get a Sprinter van and uh, or you know non-regulated vehicles or smaller regulated vehicles, and you can ramp up fairly quickly. So if you have that. Uh, in your growth plan and you don't have the bandwidth to road test everybody. Uh, we have testers around the country. Uh, there's also carriers that just don't have the uh, resources to have, uh, you know, a couple of CDL drivers sitting around 
waiting for the next class uh, to to graduate. And an idle driver is one that's looking for a job. So um, you want to make sure they're tested well and tested quickly after they make themselves available uh, to you. Um, the other uh, carriers that do a lot of remedial training, um, if and they believe in remedial training. Uh, if you get that, if you're a you know 48 state carrier and you get a driver that's in a, a, a crash in a state that's not close to one of your terminals, um, having uh, a, an evaluator do a, a remedial test or remedial training within a few days, you can really cut the uh, repeat uh, offender rate uh, down uh, tremendously. I know I saw the results of it. If we could get it done within a week, uh, we eliminated. Um, repeats in two-thirds of the uh, cases. The longer we waited, the more likely it was a driver was going to have a similar uh, uh, accident. So, so you uh, weren't then, only per performing driving tests at the point of hire? Uh, correct. Right, right. Exactly. Um, what we, we did, uh, we made sure that every uh, two years our uh, drivers got evaluated regardless. They put everybody through their faces. My experienced uh, guys, a few of them admitted that, hey, I got uh, complacent and the road test really helped me. Uh, we also tested drivers after uh, extended uh, absence, uh, return to work, uh, especially important today with the advanced vehicles, the uh, safety technology, when you have uh, active braking, active steering, uh, and warnings, drivers have to know what's, what's going to come at them in the newest technology. So. Uh, it was a road test or a, more of an orientation that we ran uh, with drivers to make sure that they were uh, comfortable with the vehicle. And if they were going into a new uh, a job like city driving, uh, you know, 16 stops a day, San Francisco, uh, we had them on orientation drives and evaluated their ability uh, to get in and out of places in kind of unorthodox methods uh, sometimes. Uh, before we let them uh, take that uh, dedicated route. And then of course we uh, put our driver trainers or people that were gonna be road test evaluators through a rigorous uh, evaluation as well. Very cool. Hey, Mark, anything else? And how do people connect with you? Uh, well, uh, don't shoot for regulatory minimums. Uh, road tests are probably one of the easiest areas to up your game and uh, uh, isn't gonna ca break the bank. Um, FMCSA and uh, juries expect that you're doing more than the minimums. And then you can connect with us at uh, jjkeller.com uh, or we have a, a Twitter handle, uh, twitter.com uh, forward slash jjkeller. Very nice. Well, hey, thanks for coming on the show today, Mark. You have a great week. Yep, you take care. Elsewhere. Let's take a look. We got some turkeys here. It's over in Roslindale, Massachusetts. This season, I'm from that area. They were like, they will completely encircle your car. Vicious birds. Little Trucker Wally said, I'd be playing whack a turkey with that Susie bar you can see on the front of the on the front of the bus right there. And Elizabeth Cusack says, You have not lived until you ride with my sister, a turkey hater. Maybe that's that road rage Mark was talking about during the uh, during the training. Well, hey, let's bring up our next guest is Teresa DeSantis. She is a Shell Rotella winner, which I believe means she drives a beautiful truck and not just like the ones at Matt's that get towed in and towed out and have new tires put on them and all that. You have a beautiful working truck. Is that not true, Teresa? That is true. It's a 1985 um, Peterbilt 359 owned since day one. Own since day one. You know, I saw, actually, we roll that little tape. We have some footage so people can see it. We saw this, I found this great video of you with your super rig. I think it's from uh, last year. You're, is this your truck, right? That is my truck. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> what a beautiful beast. Now, you said that is a, a 1985? Yes. Yep. How long you been driving that truck? Did you, have you had it since the beginning? Is this something you restored? Um, I started driving in 1984. That seems like forever ago. Um, got my license, started a cab over Kenworth, double bunk with my husband. And then we bought this truck to replace it. And I stayed with him for like three years till I was comfortable to drive on my own. 
that I, I'm noticing a theme in there too. I see the ruby slippers. I see a bunch of broomsticks. I, I see some cats. There's a witch theme going on over here. Where did, where did that come from? Um, that came from driving the back roads. I used to go up to um, the salt flats every, every week for a hazmat company and you have to stop at the railroad tracks and i put my four ways on did my normal gonna stop and a guy passed me over the railroad tracks and i'm like hey and he said shut up and he didn't call me a witch but <laughs> i went with the witch theory and it's much more friendly got to turn the uh, the haters into a positive like this is a very beautiful truck how much work does it take to maintain a truck to like a super rig type winning standard um well i usually stop driving the end of november beginning of december every year now for the last 8 years i should say not every year um and we actually take the tires off we take everything apart, look at it, make sure it's all good to go, put it back together. And while it's apart, I actually clean it. How long does that take? That I mean, that looks like it could be a work. This you do an amazing job on this truck. Uh, it it takes a long time. Yep, I'm still working on it. <laughs> now, let, let me ask you something. What is this sort of contest for those who maybe have never entered a truck into a Shell Rotella Super Rigs event before they don't even know about it? What is this all about? Um, well, it's 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 representing Shell Rotel, which I've I talked with my husband. We've used that oil since 1985. When this truck was brand new, we we said we got to stick with an oil that we can trust, that you can get everywhere. So this is the oil we went with, Show Rotel. Interesting. And so, and how like how does this contest work? How do you enter your truck into it? You just sign up for, like any other truck show. You sign up. This one actually doesn't cost money to enter. Um, you sign up and. I mean, the first truck show I ever went to was in Las Vegas, and I showed up thinking my truck was clean. I mean, that's <laughs> what people told me. Yeah. And when I got to the truck show, well, I found out differently that that is not clean. So now that's why we take it apart. We we clean everything. Um, we don't take the drums off the brakes, but inside, outside wheels, you name it, it's done. Um, but the shell contest, I'm still thinking I might enter this year again. It's just a lot of fun meeting people and, and talking with people coming up in the ranks. What do you get for winning the event? Do you, do you get anything special? Well, I did. I got, I won it twice and I got $10,000, which oh, no. normally <laughs> all those trophies behind me, that's what you normally get. And this this contest you get you get actually I'll show you what you get. Yeah, you get ten thousand dollars. I don't know if I can move you nicely. Um let's see if it can catch up. That isn't a and you get those trophies. Look at that. So those are up there just Yeah, how, how many big to fit anywhere else? <laughs> wow, how many trophies has how many times have you won like a beauty contest with this truck? Um, I'm going to guess like seven or eight times. Not bad. Not bad at all. When, nope. when, she's, not, <laughs> when she's not working, because this is a work truck event, what is she, what are you usually hauling? Yeah. I haul anything that can go on a flatbed that fits in a Conestoga, only because I don't want to throw tarps. I'm getting a little older for throwing tarps and a little weaker. So anything that fits in a Conestoga, usually machinery or, or steel. How did you find life behind the wheel? You mentioned you got, you meant, and sorry, I almost said a long time ago. I was alive in the 80s too. I don't mean to say a long time ago, but it, it was <laughs> some years ago. What brought you into a yeah. truck in the first place? Um, my, my husband's brother was a over the road driver and they had old trucks. I mean, to go to Ohio and back took a week, one week. That's like unheard of now. 
but um, it took them a week to go from Ohio, uh, from Massachusetts, because that's where I'm originally from also. Um, but it took a week. And I took a ride to New Jersey with him and just fell in love with trucking. I thought that was a great opportunity. Has this industry changed at all from the 80s until now and to how women are regarded? Is it safer or better for women? Has it gotten worse? What's been your experience over this timeline? Um, it's gotten better as in truck stops and showers and stuff like that. Um, you still go to a truck stop, I'll, have, I'll see a guy, and I, and I might struggle to back in somewhere. But I always, as we know, the goal, get out and look. I don't care if I look 10,000 10, times. I'm not going to hit somebody. But um, you show up at shippers, and, and you get out, and you're a lady driver. And, of course, being the size I am, they have their doubts, and I'm okay with it. But after you show them that you do kind of know how to drive after 40 years, so then they adjust and everything goes on. But as for truck stops, and it's gotten a lot better for ladies out there. Aside from uh, winning trophies, what's like the most rewarding part of being a truck driver for you? Having the same truck for 40 years. That that's my life my truck is my life i don't i golf but i'm terrible yeah but then i i do my <laughs> i do my trucking and i'm a lot better at trucking than golfing let's say that you do you try to stop by any courses when you're out on a run do you do you bring the clubs with you in the cab no no but i have some in indy and i think i'm bringing a set to massachusetts so i can practice a little more <laughs> You know, we're always trying to get young women interested in this profession, but obviously it's one that is not for everybody. What advice would you have for women who are thinking of, of taking up the keys and jumping in a cab and, and being a driver? If I mean, try it out. You got to know if you like being gone. Is I mean, when I leave the beginning of May, I usually don't come home until the end of November, beginning of December. Now, doesn't mean I don't have places to stay. I have family in Mass and, and I have people in Indy, but you gotta know that you like being gone away from your family that much. And if you're gonna try it, you gotta give it all. Don't give up, just keep trying. We all make mistakes, just don't make crazy mistakes. Interesting, interesting. Interesting. Any so so like what's next after you win this award? You back you back pulling you back pulling loads. You back behind it. You're gonna maybe you said you might enter. You'll be the next Shell Rotel winner, and then uh, and then it's back yeah. on pulling loads. Yeah. Well, I'll leave in May, and I'll take a load to. I'll try to get a load to um, Texas to enter. I, I never go to a show just empty. You like to go and pay your your way, um, and then I'll be off across the country again try to stay away from northwest because they got too many hills <sighs> and then california doesn't like my truck so i am not allowed there but otherwise i'll just be out and about hey we, we may have some on uh, uh, some generous listeners listening for your truck what is the next big thing you want to get for that thing oh i don't think she needs anything she doesn't um, perfect I, I don't want to change anything. I mean, the, the interior is original, except for the floor. There's, I don't know what to change. Maybe a different Caterpillar engine, Ooh. but I mean, I got to stick with my cat. It's non-electric, and that's what I like. <laughs> Well, it's a beautiful rig. Thank you so much for sharing some of your story and some of our journey with us. People want to, uh, are you on social media? Can people follow you? How do they keep up with what, what you do? I'm, I'm on Facebook. Um, I don't know much about social media and I'm going to blame my age. It's, I'm scared to dabble with it. Yeah, no, it, it can get you in trouble. You got to be careful out there on the internet. <laughs> well, hey, thank you so much yeah. for joining us on the show. I'll, I'll let you get. I'll let you get back to what you're doing. And hey, if you enter that contest, best of luck on bringing home yet another trophy.
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, this might not win a Super Rig winner, but let's take a look at this tiny truck right here. Nonetheless, my friends over at the Logistics Lounge, they caught the tiniest chapel on 18 wheels down in mats. I guess there's actually a full-size version of this truck. They were in there. There's, a, I guess, a ministry that goes around to these different events. And, of course, they're almost like the Shriners over here with their, their little vehicle going, on, going around the property. I, I, might have to, I might have to join and, and say a prayer if, just, just to get myself one of those things. Those are beautiful. It's Harbor Time says, ah, to be young again. Used to see those quite often in Illinois. Really? <laughs> Who in Illinois was driving around in one of those? I have no idea what he's talking about. Oh, we got one more guest before we send you home today. She's showing up right now. It's Molly Mangan, SVP of Sales at Echo Global Logistics. Molly, what do you think of the tiny truck? I was going to say, uh, come on over to Echo. We actually have a tiny truck that you can drive at our headquarters in Chicago. So... No way. Stop on by. If you need a reason to come, Dooner, I think is, that's is, is it just, I've been in your office before. In 2019, we, we filmed like a show in there called Inside the Box. So I got to take a tour and I saw your game room and everything, but it's been five years. I mean, it's half a decade. It's yeah. been way too long. Yeah, we actually just finished our um, second floor expansion. So I think it's a good reason for you to come. But uh, right in the lobby, there is, in fact, an Echo uh, tiny truck. I, I don't know if I would call it tiny because I feel like if it fits an adult, it's probably yeah. more of like a medium truck, but still. Yeah, and not like a legal full-size truck. By the way, did you see the reason? Yeah, not street legal. I would not recommend taking that down the mean streets of Chicago. Before we get into YouTube, let's give a little cowbell for Teresa, amazing woman driver. I don't know if you saw her truck. She's a Shell Rotel winner. And these, like, I was just at Matt's. And at Matt's, they have a ton of show trucks. But a lot of those show ponies, they never touch asphalt. Like, right? They get towed in there. They have new tires put on. This is actually a real working truck. So super cool to hear. Now, how about yourself? Introduce yourself to my lovely audience over here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Molly Mangan. I am a senior vice president of sales here at Echo Global Logistics. I've been with Echo now for 15 years. Yes. Uh, done a lot of different jobs throughout my career, but uh, right now really focusing on our small business shippers and how we continue to be a uh, provider of choice for them in all aspects of shipping and transportation. I was looking at your back. You're like a rarity, like 15 years, 14, 15 years with one company. You don't really see that much these days. Now, before I get into like insure tech, because I was curious, I saw you played volleyball. What is the I key did. to a perfect volleyball serve? Ooh, so I had a mean jump float. There's different types. Um, I would say with a jump float, your goal is to hit the ball a specific way because then depending on the temperature in the gym, the size of the gym, it'll drop float. Um, get you a certain ace, but I love that you researched that. I'm, I'm a washed up athlete now, so I don't talk about it too much. Hey, are, are, are we all? Aren't we all? But we got we to gotta dredge up those hard <laughs> memories on shows like today on this before we get into talking about protecting LTL cargo. I've been talking so much about cargo theft. There's actually just another big theft that happened. It was a $40,000 yogurt shipment. Who even steals yogurt? Like, how quick do you have to move <laughs> yogurt? It's perishable, but that got stolen. Kourtney Kardashian's, or yeah, it was, was it not Kourtney? It was her sister. I was going to say, was it like a rambunctious group of toddlers? That I sounds don't know. like uh, someone. <laughs> Chloe Kardashian's gummies got stolen. Um, there's, there's just been so much theft recently, and obviously yeah. collisions we show all the time on here. What, let's, let's talk about LTL cargo. How do we protect that? Yep. Well, I think, I think you could do kind of like a public service announcement, right? Like, have you or anyone you know been negatively impacted by an LTL cargo claim? And I think every single person who's ever been in logistics and worked in the LTL space, certainly there's been challenges with, you know, how coverage works. And from an LTL carrier's perspective, right, they're very... Um, methodical in their approach of how they cover the freight, the reasons for that, rigors of transportation, risks associated. But as our shippers, right, especially some of our small business shippers, there's a lack of education and understanding of just what's covered and what's not through exclusions, through limits of liability, et cetera. And so from an echo perspective, you know, we are always looking at tech and how we stay on the forefront of everything. But I think we're also looking at what are some of the challenges that our clients experience and how do we make a better experience for our clients? And I think that's really where Insure Plus came in to say, you know, we know our carriers have their limits of liability. We fully respect that. But from a shipper perspective, how do we ensure that our clients are fully protected? And that's where Insure Plus comes in as a full, full shipper insurance, right? It's not beholden to the limits of liability. What you insure your product for is covered for with Insure Plus. 
Now, if I'm used to like FTL and then I, I start moving some LTL freight, what do, what do I need to know insofar as insurance? What's different about insuring this type of freight versus uh, your typical full trailer? Yeah, so full truckload, right, you see your typical limits of liability being at about 100K. There's obviously carriers who do more than that, but that's assumed that whatever you put on that, that trailer is going to have 100K in coverage. With LTL, right, it can look, it can vary on a per pound basis. It can vary as a, an exclusion, right? Is it used product? Is it new product? And so the carriers in their rules tariff state all of that. And so it really is different that you could move two different products and have two completely different coverages on the same shipment because of how each product is covered at LTL. And so it gets very complex and it's hard for clients to know and be, you know, the experts on that. And that's really where we come in as Echo and say, hey, utilize Insure Plus, no matter, it kind of takes that same approach of whatever's in the trailer, um, we're going to cover that as long as it's not part of our exclusions, which we ensure um, we try to inform our clients as best as possible. But from our perspective, it really kind of gives them that reassurance that no matter what, this is going to be covered, regardless of kind of what happens throughout the, the life cycle of the load. Now, Molly, what if I'm a gambler and I'm like, nothing's going to happen to this freight here. We send them all the time. Nothing happens. Who cares about insurance? What, what, what kind of liability, what kind of risks am I opening myself up to? Well, I would say as I used to, one of my many jobs at Echo, I did run the claims department. I think it's the, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity where it's like, you're, you're going to get a claim, like just by being that risk, um, risk heavy, like that's naturally what's going to happen. And I think, you know, obviously if you don't have proper coverage, um, you know, say it's a $10,000 shipment and the carrier's limit, limit of liability, you know, is only up to a thousand dollars, you're $9,000 in the hole. And so, from our perspective, you know, I'm always going to tell people that you got to kind of assume that if something goes wrong, you want to have that proper coverage. And so, again, with Insure Plus, the idea behind it is get full coverage, pay a small fee and rest assured that, you know, not only are you going to have that full coverage, but your claims experience is going to be significantly better as well. Now, you mentioned Insure Plus before. I haven't used it before. How, how does it work? What yep. fill me in? So there's really two ways that you can use Insure Plus. Echo Ship, which is our online shipper platform, as you're filling out your load, you can easily put in the value of the cargo. We'll automatically calculate what that insurance rate will be and build it into the load automatically for you. Or for those of our clients or anyone who's interested, you can also partner with your Echo rep directly who can add that into any and all quotes that we send you so that you can select automatically Insure Plus on that load. And I think... You know, from a claims perspective, kind of going back to your gambling question of, you know, should I, should I or shouldn't I? I think from our perspective, what makes it so much better is, you know, we're, you don't have to necessarily deal with um, the LTL claims process, right? The CARMAC amendment allows LTL carriers to have up to 120 days to resolve a claim, which again, understandably so, they want to make their proper investigations. With shipper, full shipper insurance, you know, all we really need is to substantiate is what happened and the value of the goods. And because it's full shipper insurance, it allows us to pay claims in as little as 10 days, um, sometimes as fast as 48 hours. Um, there's no deductible up to $10,000. So you're not necessarily dealing with, hey, I bought insurance, but there's a $1,000 deductible on every load. It really allows, especially our small and mid-sized shippers, the ability to protect their freight for minimal cost and minimal risk. So what's the process like uh, in the unfortunate event? I, I do have a claim, there's an accident, there's some theft or something like that. Shipment ends up in the mm -hmm. wrong place. What does that process look like? Is it is it more seamless? Do you make it better? Does my claim get paid quicker? Yeah. How does that go? That, all of those things, all of the above. So you can go on, if you're an Echo Ship client of Echo, you can go in, fill out, add your claim information, right? We still need standard claim information. I always, the best analogy I use for a claim is, it's as if you're going on a court case, right? And so you have to bring your evidence. You wouldn't go to court and say, you know, this happened, but I have nothing to prove it. So pictures of the damage, you know, invoices that substantiate the value. As soon as you, all you have to do is go on echoship.com, fill out your claim form, and then we immediately submit it to the underwriter and then dependent, right? Like I said, it's pretty quick. Um, and in as fast as 10 days, I've seen claims paid in the same day, as long as we have substantiation of documentation. 
um, and we're able to move past that claim quickly. And again, for a lot of businesses, we know that claims, it's to say it's painful is probably an understatement because it impacts cash flow because more than likely the client is shipping out um, an immediate shipment, right, or a replacement, et cetera. And so this allows us to move much quicker through the process of getting our clients their money back for these damages, losses, et cetera. What is like in, in LTL, what's like the number one source of claims? Is it damage in movement of the freight because it's getting moved around so much? Yeah, I think there, you know, you think about the rigors of transportation. A lot of times people, especially if you're not too familiar, right? When you think about how a pallet sits on a trailer, you know, it's kind of that constant, if you like jiggling or if there's any sort of stoppage, right, et cetera, freight can shift, freight can get damaged, forklifts, et cetera. So typically what we see is, claims that have, you know, some damage, et cetera. Oftentimes, right, it could be, hey, did the shipper package it correctly? And that would be a reason, an exclusion that the carrier would say this was not packaged properly for rigors of transportation. With our full shipper insurance, that's still covered under Echo Insure Plus. So again, kind of a, it, it really is a catch-all to ensure that no matter what happens on that shipment, you have coverage. What do you think the biggest mistake LTL shippers are making? Is it just foregoing coverage? Is it their packing? How, like, what's the problem? I think understanding, right, in an LTL network, how often the freight is moving on and off a trailer, and that if you don't have your freight protected appropriately, you're opening yourselves up to issues. And in defense of the carriers, right, they're not necessarily doing anything wrong, but if you're shipping, you know, a, a product from New York to LA, you may be hitting you know, four, five, even six terminals, depending. And so, you know, that's a forklift driver picking it up, putting it onto a new trailer, et cetera. So I think you really have to be mindful as a shipper of, it's moving on a truck, right? This is not a cargo jet with, you know, luxury service. You have to make sure as your obligation to the shipper to protect yourself, both from how you package the freight, but then also leveraging something like Insure Plus to kind of give you that extra layer of protection and commitment of payment if there is an issue. Makes sense. Well, hey, Molly, before I let you go, anything new and exciting coming up out of Echo this year or coming up in the near future? I would just say we recently launched um, partial quoting and shipments on Echo Ship, so I know that that's something we're extremely excited about. We also, Echo Insure Plus also covers partial shipments, so that's something that we can work with. But I think, you know, from an Echo perspective, it, being here 15 years, we never stop growing. We never stop creating. And I think for us, like, sky's the limit. But I would say anybody interested, we just launched partial quoting. And it's been a pretty new and exciting tool. And I think for anyone who moves volume LTL or, you know, shipments that fall outside that six pallets or more but isn't quite a full truckload should check out partial quoting on, on uh, Echo Ship. Great. How do they go do that? Where do we send them to? Uh, echo.com is absolutely if you have already are an echo ship client just log in on echo ship but echo.com if you're interested in learning more about echo ship insure plus we have a contact us form feel free to fill that out or feel free to link me in um, I'm on LinkedIn I think as is everyone but happy to talk more about insure plus and how we prevent more claims tears frustrations and issues for our clients by the way is that a mini gong behind you over your shoulder <laughs> It is a mini gong. It's from um, when I ran, I ran our uh, LA office for quite some time over the pandemic. And it was before you had the mute all capabilities on teams. <laughs> and uh, the Echo West sales team, I got to give them a shout out, are rowdy and wonderful. And so I was sent a gong by one of our sales reps, Ben Barlev, to be able to try and cajole the team. Um, and then once the mute all functionality came in, it, the gong was kind of obsolete, but I still keep it as a token of my appreciation for all of them. Well, this is like Chekhov's gun and Chekhov's in literature and Chekhov's gun. If you see a gun on the wall, it has to show up in the story. You're, you're, you have to ring that now that we've seen it. Does, do you have the little mallet? Can you hit it for us? Can I you do. Ring I off? do. Oh my gosh. I can't believe you saw that. That's so funny. All right. Thank you so much for <laughs> having so me. Much. Have a great day, everybody. You too. Beautiful. Nice hit. Nice hit. Thank you, everyone. Check out Molly and Echo. Thank you so much. Before I send you home, just a couple of headlines on FreightWaves.com to let you all know about. As we talked about with Jet in the beginning, six workers are still missing from the, the Francis Scott Key Bridge. They are, of course, presumed dead now, and that happened quite some time ago, over a day ago. Uh, Baltimore Port Closure has put truck drivers and 
um, auto haulers in a bid. As we also mentioned with Jet, all that roll on, roll off can't get over into the port now. They're going to have to figure out how to reposition all that freight. Uh, court has dismissed Yellow's $137 million lawsuit against Teamsters. This was brought up. Yellow's breach of contract suit against the Teamsters was brought up. It was thrown out by a court in Kansas City. Read the full thing on FreightWaves.com. And FedEx pilots have picked their third union chairman since last summer. I don't know what's going on with the FedEx pilots chairman. I'll have to read the article by Eric Coolish to figure out. In the meantime, find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Find the show at FW What the Truck. Download it wherever you get your podcast. Just look up What the Truck Freightways YouTube channel. And of course, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, Sirius XM's Road Dog Trucking Channel 146. Take care, everybody, and don't be a stranger. Wednesday, welcome in to today's Freight Waves Now Community Spotlight. I'm Kaylee Nix, and we are here on this Wednesday catching up with the one and only Alan Adler. We're here to talk a little truck tech. And Alan, today we've got a pretty exciting three-way partnership to talk about, and not necessarily brand new news, but news that is continuing to develop. Talk to us a little bit about Green Lane. Yeah, Green Lane, uh, you know, well-named, I think. It is a, uh, a joint venture, I suppose, is the best way to call it, between Daimler Truck North America, uh, Next Era Energy, and BlackRock, uh, their, their investment part of BlackRock, which basically is working on uh, a, a, what will eventually be a nationwide infrastructure for electric trucks. Medium and heavy duty are the primary focus. So they'll do some hydrogen eventually as well. But it's a big number. It's over $650 million that they're putting into it. They're just now beginning to launch their first sites, which will sort of be in that corridor between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, and then next to Southern Nevada and, and some other places like that. Uh, the big focus for these guys will be West Coast, East Coast, and then sort of the what's called the Texas Triangle, you know, San Antonio and, and Dallas and Houston. And uh, so, you know, lots of work to do to get both sites as well as, you know, energy uh, on the site, things like that. So Patrick McDonald King, who is the CEO uh, formerly of uh, EV Connect, um, took that job last September. Uh, he's now bringing it closer to launch. Uh, 